Hi, I'm Jeff Nyquist in the United States and with me is Alex Benish in Germany. We're going to be discussing some updates on Ukraine and the problems in the United States. This week we had uh, Joe Biden on the 7th of March give his State of the Union address and uh, it was rather striking. At the beginning of his State of the Union address he said that there is an assault on freedom and democracy and he of course put Russia at the top of this assault, which is true. But then he referred to January 1st, the, the fabricated insurrection, uh, really just a riot where uh, some folks broke into the Capitol building, but calling it an insurrection. Um, and, and basically kept referring to Donald Trump without naming him as being the core of this uh, assault on democracy, which uh, he was putting uh, MAGA and the Republicans together with Putin and the Russians. Uh, this is going to be an increasing uh, propaganda theme. It is a myth creation. There has been building for the last decade this myth that all these Democrats who collaborated with Russia and China and the communists all these years, who did the Russia reset with uh, under Obama, that helped uh, finance the Russian Silicon Valley, that uh, did the... Uh, the um, um, the Uranium One deal, uh, suddenly do this backflip and now they're fighting against the enemies of democracy and freedom and Trump is the enemy and they're, they're making it come true. And I think it's, I think my speculation is that there's Russian agents in MAGA helping to drive the narrative there. You got dummies like uh, Tucker Carlson, who are helping the narrative go there, people like Scott Ritter, people like General Douglas McGregor, and so the right is drifting into a trap. Um, at the same time, you've got things going on in Germany, like the Luftwaffe uh, tape and the Taurus missiles going there, and of course the war in Ukraine itself. Uh, just yesterday, Today we're broadcasting on the 9th. On the 8th, the headlines were the Russians lost 850 soldiers in one day, 50 artillery systems, and six armored fighting vehicles. So the war is really heated up. They, there's other stories saying that the Ukrainians have rebuilt a defensive line, that the Russians have slammed into it, and are just suffering horribly. There's a lot of comments on why these increasing failures by the Russian military. But, uh, Alex, why don't you... Uh, Tell us a little bit about what you see going on there. Well, I find it, I find it incredibly slimy to, you know, to see the Democrats playing um, different sides and angles. Now, we remember in the Tucker Carlson Putin interview, um, Carlson was asking this kind of Carlson was asking his leading question: What do you think are the secret? groups or whatever that make the decisions in the United States, you know, who's really running things. And he was kind of expecting an answer from Vladimir Putin along the lines of, well, it's the globalists, it's the woke, this and woke that. But Putin would not give such an answer because uh, Putin is also uh, still playing towards a, a left wing audience as well. And, and he is, uh, Putin would be more than happy to uh, cooperate with the Democrats in the future, if, if that is to Russia, Russia's advantage, of course. And the same thing, of course, in Germany, our left wing government, um, with all its, its blunders, I mean, from the, I mean, it's, it's, they've always been very pro Russia. Um, and uh, they want to play every kind of angle. They want to still be able to buy gas from Russia in the future. They want to say, oh, this war is in the past. Let's all forget about it. Let's forgive Russia like the left had forgiven Russia anything. You know, the gulags, the, you know, political cleansing operations, uh, Vietnam, Korea, forgiving You know, I might, I might interject uh, in, in, to add to what you just said. Um, uh, my thought is that there's something that Mr. Wang told me that keeps sticking in my mind. Mr. Wang, who had worked in the People's Liberation Army and now is a, a uh, Chinese diaspora broadcaster, anti-communist party of China. And, and he said that the Chinese communist elite regarded Biden as one of their own. Hmm. And I think that uh, Vladimir Putin regarded Obama and the Clintons as his own people, really. Um, this is my take. And uh, what's happened, I think, is this aggression in Russia and the military buildup in China has frightened 
their minions here, their friends in the West, is frighten them. And I think that um, maybe one of the explanations for the Tucker for uh, Putin's uh, interview Evasive with Tucker Carlson answer. He's trying to say, look, uh, you know, come on back to us. Uh, mm. Don't be so afraid. Don't be suddenly. Maybe they spooked their buddies here in the West that have been aiding and abetting them all this time, thinking, oh, my gosh, they're good. They want to wipe us all out. They want to take over mm. the world, which is something I think these 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 idiots call them moral idiots. These moral idiots never considered before that, oh, it's just fun game of uh, subversion in the wet. You know, I think there's this attitude among people, my generation and older, that it America is somehow hot. invincible. Yeah, and things yeah. never and get really hot. And in the really world, will never get hot, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, we'll, just, we'll just profit by this, uh, this, this intrigue. We'll be playing games forever, you know, the games we're all familiar with. I mean, yeah, it's, it's just like um, when, uh, uh, you know, when the Cold War, when the Cold War happened, um, the the western the western left um they 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 were looking for allies globally and they thought you know communism was was their ally and so they made all these excuses and um and so now section of maga some of the right wingers they're they're doing the same thing that the left had done they're looking for these allies they're looking for a savior and uh they're trying to uh, create this impression of having this worldwide movement because that sounds impressive and that gets them new members and it just energizes the activists you know by by claiming we have this backup over there you know the superpower that's with us i mean you know the left in in the past in the west you know the left it kind of needed this marketing ploy to say over there is not just a powerful force an ally with nuclear weapons but they also live better than we do and they show us how it's done and uh so some of the right wingers in the west now they're using the same line of argument they're saying they live better over there uh life is better under russian control and i have some notes about what actually happens if you ever come under russian control um i recently i recently saw a post on x where somebody poses the question who would accept who would accept getting drafted into the U.S. military to fight against Russia? Now, I wrote about this years ago. I knew this problem would eventually come up. A war situation, a new draft, people would refuse because they see Russia as an ally and liberator, not as an enemy. As we know, the truthers believe Putin had freed his people from the globalist, meaning Jewish, world conspiracy, and the United States is still occupied by the same globalists. Therefore, Americans have to cooperate with Russian intelligence assets and troops on American soil. Um, so let's imagine millions of Americans refusing the draft, concentrating in some states or areas of the United States and telling the federal government to stay away from them. Uh, so, yeah, this could play out in, in different ways. Now, for example, to avoid a civil war, an agreement could be made to have some states or areas uh, leave the Union in these areas then collaborate with Russia. Now, this seems to be the favorite scenario of some people, uh, some conservatives in the West. And I got a ton of notes here um, to explain why this is like a really dumb idea and very dangerous idea. Now, um, we Germans, we Germans have experience um, with a split country with a, you know, conservative or, you know, republic part, and a Russian controlled other part, you know, back then it was communist uh part of of germany and so life was really different in these two germanies and uh when the reunification happened these two germanies they didn't really recognize each other they it was very hard to connect and and just to put yourself into the minds of the other side okay so um this is what what russia had done to germans over the course of a few decades you know completely changing people's mindset um just just wrecking people's um sense of security because you, you could never feel safe under russian control you never knew who was spying on you your friends family members anybody could spy on you um so uh yeah this is um this is a problem that uh many people don't actually see now for the left especially the democrats 
for the Democrats, it's always about this big right-wing world conspiracy. Okay, so they are conspiracy buffs. They are just as much a conspiracy theory crowd, just as much as the classic conspiracy activists. And I, I, I explained this, uh, I think, in one of our shows when I... Um, when I talked about, you know, how in the 1800s, even the early 1800s, where you could already see the first, I think this was a British uh, member of parliament, a communist, an early socialist, right? And this guy, he put out this book, he wanted to sound scientific, and he basically presented his conspiratorial worldview, whereas he, um, he gave equal attention to Jewish people, but also every capitalist and every traditionalist and everybody who just, you know, uh, was, was not what he liked. So he had it like 50-50, okay? And, and his foundational text then was picked up and was used by the left and, and the extreme right wing. Now, the left eventually over, you know, within a few decades, the left had then minimized or almost eliminated the anti-Semitic aspects of it, but they kept everything else intact. If you're not a commie, you're bad and you're part of a conspiracy or you're at least tolerating. You're part of the 1%. Or well, you're, to right? yeah, you it's work the for them. You, exactly. You work for them. everything. You, you're 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 either part of the conspiracy or you try to benefit from the conspiracy, so you are uh, an ex an accessory uh, to all of this, and so this became the later stage conspiratorial worldview of the left. Now, of course, for Joe Biden, now he can sell this, he can milk this as as far as he can, and it all makes sense to the left wing audience because they already believe in the right wing world conspiracy, and now they they. It's, Proof seems to be everywhere, even though it's much more complicated. Okay, right wingers, some of them, you know, like Russia because they don't really understand Russia. Um, Putin pretends to be right wing, which he's not really. I mean, he refused the the "Are you a Christian?" question in the Tucker Carlson interview, right? Yes, he did. And he and Putin gave some very communist or let's say Marxist Leninist. Um, arguments in that interview you know when he talked about how china was so successful in, in in business and china was just outproducing america and because china is so successful you know with communism that's why the evil fascist american pigs that's why these these uh, american pigs then try to mess it all up for the communists that's why they use ukraine to attack mother russia and all of that because america wants to rule it all and they don't want to see uh, communist China succeeds. So Putin was using a communist argument, very important line of reasoning, uh, Leninist mm -hmm. reasoning in the same interview. So it, it was, the interview was with a Western right-wing guy, Tucker Carlson, but it was not, in, in content-wise, it was not really, was not really a conservative interview, if you think about it. I mean, we talked about this. I mean, the, the main aspect, I think, was the comparison between the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union and today's NATO. So for Russia, it's all the same. I mean, in right. in the year twenty, in the year twenty twenty four, this comparison is still made. NATO is just like the Nazis, and they want to invade Mother Russia. Really, this was a communist interview where people are just patting each other on the back. This is such a conservative interview. Well, what? the myth, the myth making art of Stalin was so great that you can't, you have to borrow from the greats, right? You, you have to copy these myths that Stalin and Lenin created, even if you have to remove some of the Stalinist or Leninist language, it's still structurally, it's the same thing. And now we have on the right, the pro proletarianization of the right, right? Because now the right represents the working class. MAGA is a working class movement. Yeah. How funny that some of these structurally, some of these same consp left wing conspiracy arguments that attached to the communist left when they were wooing the proletariat. Now, of course, they're wooing in the West. They're wooing the gays and the transgendered and the minorities and the women. And you'll notice in, in Biden's speech was extreme attempt to woo women. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was women, 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 you know, and it's it that this one phrase in his speech was about how we're going to finally end the scourge against women in this country, mm -hmm. you know.
Like women are just trampled down even right now, and it's got to end now. And so yeah, because it's, women it's, had it so great in communism. You know, being a woman in communism was the greatest thing ever. No, it wasn't. Well, they had it so great in the Middle Ages, right? <laughs> I mean, even even you today, know, even today in China, even today in China, if you, if you're a pretty woman, if you're a, a sports famous sports athlete in China, you will get these powerful people to 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 chase you and you cannot refuse them without actually ruining your life or you're at a university and you're studying something because you want to have a real job and make real money in china as a woman you're going to be hunted and chased by these communist people in the university and outside of the university these party members and you cannot refuse them this is actual life for women under communism and i was i was recently i saw this thing this was like of an older clip um that circulated on x this was a video from michael moore if people still remember that guy um so michael moore he was just just raging about donald trump speaking to the workers the working class and so he was ranting and raving oh my god how can he dare to make these people angry and you know these people that have been shafted and he makes them angry and you know voting for trump is like throwing a a, a you know you know, he's speaking not, he's not, um, doesn't mean it literally, throwing a hand grenade into the system by voting for Trump. Yeah, I mean, what what did the left do for so long? They made they people- hand grenades into the system. <laughs> angry, just so angry. So like, like why why is this so different? And um, it's, it's almost like there's a new sheriff in town and the co they don't appreciate the competition. Yeah, it's like right. this this whole provocation strategy. I mean, we talked about, you know, critical theory, but I think an underestimated aspect of critical theory, which is just whining and subversion, um, an, an, an underestimated aspect of it is just this incredible amount of provocation. You go so over the top, you become threatening, and then you wait for the reaction of the right wing. And the crazier they react, the more you can use that material um, against the right and say, well, look, everybody, look how crazy they are. So the left will say, we're coming for your children. We will re-brain -bra -re brainwire your children. Um, we will do this. We will sue anybody who misgenders anybody. We will force you this and force you that. So it's one group, one tribe with their war paint on, literal, you know, clown makeup war paint, um, threatening the other tribe, the conservatives. And so, um, yeah, the, the natural reaction to a threat is to make threats. So this is where the right wing, especially, you know, the, the extreme types and some of these extreme MAGA types, you know, they may be working for the for the other side secretly. Um, some of these extreme right wingers then become very exaggerated in their own threats. So they will say, we're going to have a nation that is 100 percent white, uh, zero rights for women, arranged marriages, um, basically fascism. This is our goal, they say. And so then the, the left can use those bits and snippets to show their their clientele, look, they're all fascists. We've been right all along. It's this right wing world conspiracy. A republic yeah, cannot a republic yeah, and, and cannot function. It, it, it's so clearly a myth. These are all mythological. I mean, just think of it. This is from Biden's speech. Uh, women's health has always been underfunded. What is he talking about? I mean, it is outrageous. I mean, they create these ideas by repetition that are completely untrue. You know, women are oppressed. Women are, that there's the scourge. They're being stomped. It's violence. It's, look, the, the world is, is imperfect. There's always going to be bad things happening to people, men and women, by the way. And, you know, it, it's, it's, but w we have, created structures and society and civilization and all kinds of things that we we keep uh, making legislation conservatives believe in incremental change so that we don't have revolutions where thousands or millions die um but but no they they want radical change they say everything's broken well what if human beings are just sort of broken to start with what if we're being mm. mere mortals 
what if the Bible is right and man is a sinful creature? So we're living from moment to moment like an alcoholic, trying to avoid doing bad. And, and inevitably, we're going to stumble. We're going to do bad. So, But they have a formula. If they blame the right people and they, they proclaim their own righteousness, and it's about anti-racism and about anti-sexism and about anti-classism, then everything will be okay. It's, it's like a myth. It's totally untrue, but people go, yeah, let's try that. And it's extremely destructive because it has no basis in reality. It's just a fiction. And just like the whole Putin's little history lesson, this is his story of Genesis, right? He's in the present moment, he's in a war in Ukraine, and so he's backfilling history to make himself justified for all the killing he's doing in Ukraine. Just myth. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a and literal, people buy it. yeah, it's a literal, it's a literal KGB Muppet, um, in, in, formerly in charge of Russia, somebody who was picked by Andropov, you know, the, the guy with the real experience, because the world would not have accepted Andropov, uh, as you know, from the KGB as a head of state, because nobody would have believed communism was over. Nobody would have believed this was a new start. Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, Andropov, you know, he had his Muppets, he had But he Gorbachev. loved jazz. Yeah. So, and he uh, was a closet liberal. Right, yeah, you know, right. the only reason he didn't get to do it is he died of kidney disease. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he, he basically cultivated his, his little puppet, uh, Gorbachev, for a long time. Uh, picked this nobody who couldn't really do anything on his own. Um, then handpicked Vladimir Putin and his judo buddies. Um, to move all the money around worldwide and put it in the city of London and just pretend change. So, um, well, uh, so so this this communist, you know, this this communist Soviet system, in so many ways, still exists to this very day. Uh, now you can have in, yeah, in altered form. They they basically uh, there's a expression perestroika means change of formation. So Napoleon once said that the key to winning a battle is to change your formation in the middle of the battle. It completely throws the enemy off. Yeah. And this is what they did in 1989 <clears throat> and 90 and 91. <clears throat> and they've, they, they're doing it again. They're, they're further doing it. Where now they're throwing off bit by bit the mask of being yeah. Christians or nationalists or capitalists. And they're actually the, the outright communist bloc is now sort of materializing before our eyes i use this and, yeah. I, I use this comparison I, people imagine if you know imagine if um imagine that that the nazis didn't lose world war ii but they instead settled with the other powers hitler was gone uh, some of the other famous Nazis were gone. They claimed National Socialism was over, never to return. If you still believe it's a threat, you live in the past. And you would still see these German Nazi corporations growing bigger, moving their money internationally. And you would see this new system, which pretends to be all, all ideologies at once. You know, a bit of, a bit of democracy, a bit of aristocracy, a bit of military leadership, a bit of this, a bit of that. And you would see that this new Germany was um was run by these old agents from the SD or or you know the other intelligence uh, former former intelligence services of the Nazis i mean could you imagine the left buying this internationally no they would say this is fake this is obviously fake they just pretended that you know the threat was over so they could you know regroup and try again later what what was different here is that we had the left willing to go along with it in the west and we had the right that desperately wanted to claim victory in the Cold War. Uh, and the right, the way I see the right, I go back to William F. Buckley, National Review, The American Spectator. I used to read that all the time in the 80s. And the thing is, is that what I realize now, retrospectively watching this for 30 years, they did not understand communism. They were so much into their conservative, and, and some of them were ideologists from the right, though conservatism is not an ideology. They could not see over their own ideas to actually see what communism was, how flexible it was, 
what its actual history was. And of course, when you go back to conspiracy theory, which true conservatives reject conspiracy theory, you had a real conspiracy with communism. And we know this from the two spy, uh, the, the two giant spy networks in Washington that the Soviets ran during World War II, that Elizabeth Bentley and, and um, uh, Whitaker Chambers, Louis Boudin's, um, and uh, Bella Dodd, all among others, testified to existing. And of course, Bentley and Chambers were actual couriers for these spy rings. And they named people like Assistant Secretary of State um, Alger Hiss, big old deal. You know, originally, uh, President Truman told the Justice Department to prosecute Whitaker Chambers for accusing Hiss, right? Yeah. To attack the messenger who was saying, look, this guy, I was, exp I, you know, I don't want to be a rat. I don't want to tell, but this is important for the country. This Alger Hiss is a spy. You had Harry Dexter White, who was appointed by Harry Truman to be Secretary of the Treasury. Big Soviet agent. Yeah. Right? I think that- Lachlan I Curry, all these others, you know? And, and so we've had this conspiracy before yeah. we've gotten at it. There's books filled, you know, there's rooms filled with the documentation <laughs> of it. And we rejected it all as McCarthyism. Yeah. And but it's real. Yeah. I mean, the, I think the American left, um, the American left for a long time has understood that they they cannot really take all of the United States. So I think the plan shifted to carving out carving up a, a, a part of america and then just keep that part of america uh and and just you know have everybody else live in in the other america because if you look at well, woke culture if you yeah. look at woke if you look at woke culture it's it's created such a, such a rift in the american population that even scientists now have made studies about uh, testosterone levels, hormone levels in woke people versus conservative people. And so because these woke people, they eat differently, they're, they're very plant-based food guys and, and girls and, and in-betweens, um, they have a completely different wor worldview, uh, these left people. They look different. You can tell if somebody is woke because they have these nose rings and now they have these nose rings with the chains that go like this and they have these colorful hair and they dress weirdly and they talk differently and so their whole de demeanor is different so it's like it's like a, 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 a its own tribe and tribes in the past they had their own war paint they had their own feathers and styles so you could immediately recognize from a distance oh he's from the other tribe and so this is why i believe um you know the 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 Democrats and generally uh, the left in America they want two Americas. They want to have one America that is just this communist woke hellhole, and and you know the other America they think is going to be these these hillbillies, uh, these fascist hillbillies. And so, well, it, uh, you opened something up by saying this. You know that James Lindsay has done a thing in his new discourses called "National Divorce Is National Suicide." It's really quite excellent. One of my readers uh, brought it to my attention this week after the uh, uh, article I published this week. And it's it's on his site, the New Discourses site. And what Lindsay analyzes this idea, you know, there's a lot of people you'll see conservatives and there's some, he's being bitterly attacked for this. Um, you, you, you see, uh, he's talking about this idea that the red states and the blue states should divide into two countries. Mm hmm and I have conservative friends who want this. It's the only solution, right? We're going to kill each other mm -hmm. if we stay here. Of course, Lindsay gives a very excellent reason why you don't want to ever go there. Uh, because you talked about the East Germany and West Germany thing. First of all, uh, the, it's not really red states and blue states. It's red urban, uh, red countryside, small town yeah. and blue urban areas. And you are never going to get rid of that subversion. And what you're doing is you're just giving half of the country away to the communists, essentially, to completely tear out the Constitution, to have complete power. They would imagine uh, a state in which you had, there was no way Republicans could get elected or have any voice. There, there couldn't be any competition between the two sides. Imagine what kind of regime would ultimately be imposed. And then in and and the right, since both states were ideological creations mm. created against the other, 
militarization against one side against the other would be inevitable. And that civil war within the red state formation would be inevitable. And the same thing in the blue state, because you would be leaving all these people behind who would not have a voice. And yeah, so and you don't a, get away from the problem. Yeah. And what happens if, if, you know, true Americana is no longer represented and you don't fit into this America and you don't fit into that America because you don't want, yeah. you don't want medieval, uh, a medieval style of living, but you also do not want communism. So this is what you call the, the scissor, um, the scissor strategy, you know, because, um, as I said, you know, people are asking, would, would you accept a draft if you had to fight against Russia? Um, and so some people would say, no, they would dodge the draft. So where would they go? And if enough people theoretically refuse to be drafted, um, this could have, you know, serious consequences such as splitting America, you know, when, uh, People seek refuge in certain territories of the United States and they say, well, we, we expect to be protected against the federal government. Um, uh, so this could lead to a situation that, um, yeah, that is kind of a bit like, you know, a bit like Western Germany and Eastern Germany. So I've, yeah. I've assembled these I've assembled these um, these notes here to tell people what it's actually like. Uh, what it's what is what it's actually like to be under Russian control, whether it, that means or communist control, whether that means you're in in the commie America and the commie America is then tied to China and Russia, or you're in, let's say, uh, some other part of America that is um, supposed to be right wing, but it's controlled by the Russians. You know, it's it's not a pleasant thing to experience, and most people have no idea what it would be like because they just do not know enough about the cold war and and even times um even times before that now um so all throughout the cold war eastern germany was under soviet meaning russian control in 1961 the border was closed um the wall was being built and it became a major crime to attempt to flee to the West. Now, the other way around was not so much a problem. You could move from West uh, to East, right? And because, because Eastern Germany was so close to the West, the government could, could be... Um, the government could not be overtly Stalinist to the highest degree because the whole world was watching. Okay, so so that close that close to the West, you had to behave to a degree. You know, you could you, you needed to be more strategic in your tyranny. But life was still a nightmare under Russian control. Uh, you got along somewhat if you followed all the rules and you didn't. And, you, you know, you didn't get unlucky because if you stepped on the wrong toes, if somebody wanted your position or somebody wanted something from you, um, that was bad luck for you. And if you were a woman in Soviet Eastern, um, Soviet Eastern Germany, if you were a woman, you had all kinds of prob problems and nobody would come to save you. And you had to accept the standard of living. Everything was controlled. What you read, what music you listen to, everything was under surveillance. Even the slightest bit of activism could get you in serious trouble. That means a joke, uh, reading a forbidden book. Um, your future was potentially ruined. So that means uh, you could not go to university. You could not get a job uh, that was nicer. You couldn't work for the government in any important fashion. You couldn't trust anybody. Uh, Soviet Eastern Germany had the highest rate of informants in recorded history. So your family members reported on you. Uh, and when the wall came down, people were allowed to access were allowed to access the files that the Stasi had on them. So imagine reading through the file they had on you and discovering that your wife, your husband, your brother or your closest friend or all of them reported you. They all informed the government about your activities and they knew about the microphones that were in your apartment or your house. Um, they knew everything, right? And, uh, and they had all these little tricks. They had all these little tricks to figure out who was talking to whom. 
uh, in Soviet Eastern Germany. Um, they had this radioactive translucent spray. So they could spray an entire floor of a suspicious apartment, right? They would spray the floor, you couldn't see it. And then they would check the shoes of certain suspects. And if your shoe had this radioactive signature, they knew you were at that particular apartment conspiring with somebody against the state. Um, and there was also the, um, the use of highly radioactive needles. So they would take a, a radioactive needle and sort of thread it into your jacket, for example. And the radiation was so high, they could read it. Uh, they could read it with a Geiger counter from a distance. I think even from outside of that particular residence from the street. So they would always know if you were close because they put a radioactive needle in your clothing. So this, is, this was life in Soviet Eastern Germany. <laughs> Okay, um, it was not pleasant, um, not pleasant at all. And this was still the softer version of Russian control because, you know, everything was so close to the West, they couldn't do everything that they wanted or everything they could potentially do. Okay, uh, so yeah, this was, um, this was just in a, in a nutshell, the reality of Soviet Eastern Germany, okay? Um, it was, it was really not, it was really not pleasant and you could try to follow all the rules, but something could come up. Somebody gets mad at you. Somebody just doesn't like you. Somebody who has more power than you, or you were a woman and you refuse somebody's advances. Your life is over. You could end up in a, in a prison cell or in a psychiatric, uh, institution. Now, the first thing I have here, um, is what I call the post-invasion cleanup. So imagine part of America uh, comes under Russian control or some some place in Western Europe or some place in the Latino world, anything. If an area comes under Russian control, you can expect what I call the post-invasion cleanup. This is, this is how it's done. This is how the Russians always do it, uh, and the Chinese as well. Uh, so first of all, Russia always has an arrest and kill list prepared. And they update these lists on a weekly basis, sometimes even uh, more often. Okay, So they always look at the territory that they, they want to uh, take over. And they knew they know exactly what persons they want killed immediately and what persons they want arrested because they think these people will become a problem. They will not be loyal to the new system. Uh, so you can expect embedded agents and special operators to kill specific people. Others are hunted and arrested. And even more people end up on a suspicious list. Okay, so... Um, if your loyalty is in question, you have dangerous skills, um, you will become disappointed with the new system, the Russians will have you on a list. Okay, so uh, they, they don't care if you helped that revolution, if you helped Russia, if you uh, liked Russia in the past, that doesn't matter. If they think you are a risk to them, they have you on a special list. And in case of unrest, they will come arrest you if your name is on that list. Um, so the um, there was the so-called Polish operation of the NKVD, Soviet Security Service, between 1937 and 1938. That was an anti-Polish mass ethnic cleansing operation of the NKVD carried out um, against Poles during the period of the Great Purge resulted in the sentencing of roughly 140,000 people and summary executions of 111,000 Poles living in or near the Soviet Union. And this was familiar to other operations such as the Greek operation, the Finnish operation, Latvian operation, and Estonian operation. So this is a template, and they will use the same template anywhere. This is just the way they do it. Um, and so in the years 1945 to 1947, about 500,000 Soviet soldiers were stationed in 
Poland, so right, at, right after the war. Between 1945 and 1948, some 150,000 Poles were Im imprisoned by the Soviet authorities and uh, many former home army members were apprehended and executed. Uh, so sometimes they kill you, sometimes they just keep you in prison and torture you and then shove you out and push you out on the street again. So people will see you, you know, what has become of you, so everybody else gets scared. Uh, this is also something you can expect if you ever come under Russian control. And uh, Yeah, there's a book, by the way, I should mention. It's called What to Do When the Russians Come. And it was written uh, towards the end of the Cold War um, by Robert, Con Conquest, uh, Robert Conquest, who wrote The Harvest of Sorrow, of course, and John Manship White. And um, it, has the, it has some interesting... Uh, things about how they would uh, do it, uh, what you'd experience, and, and they gave these following bullet points. Uh, apart from purely military destruction, the economy will be disrupted. Business Businesses producing anything except the barest necessities will, without exception, collapse. Oil will no longer be imported. Most domestic American oil will be earmarked for official use. That's if America is occupied. Nationalization of all major firms will take place. Small firms will face the same fate within a year or two. Personal savings will be wiped out by currency reforms. Uh, uh, grain, which has already been frequently um, uh, in, in, in shortage, uh, will be even harder to get a hold of. Uh, the Russians will take whatever foodstuffs they want, and food shortages will be rampant. And large amounts of engineering equipment will be uh, stolen and taken and removed to Russia. So, and of course, this is yep. in the occupied areas of Ukraine. I think they've already been experiencing this. Exactly. And so, the other um, the other standard operating procedure is the establishment of the new political elite. They call it the nomenklatura, or they used to call it that. So it's like managers, administrators, um, anybody that um, that they need. And sometimes they will take Russians for these positions. Sometimes they will take local people uh, whom they trust um, uh, for those positions. So they expect you as an American, for example, they expect you to support all these policies that you just mentioned and, and also the, the roundups, the cleaning operations. Um, and so those people who play along, those people who um, execute these orders, they will be promoted. Um, they will be promoted over and over again. And sometimes even those guys will be cleansed, you know, because for some reason um, the government stops, uh, the new government stops trusting them. Um, and, uh, yeah, then military conscription. Uh, yeah, for example, in Poland, they soon had a standing army of 400,000 men. So you are forced or enticed to serve in the new military. Then some more mass arrests, 5,000 people here, 20,000 people there. Um, and of course, Soviet style planning. Uh, will begin so he heavy industry or whatever they need um, they will tell people to work in a specific factory so you can no longer choose what career to pursue they will give you maybe three options to pick from or they will make the decision completely by themselves so you will work in a factory making weapons or making other goods and uh, they will tell you how long your workday is and what you get paid for and what you can buy with your money. Um, if there is any cash money, probably there won't be uh, much cash money around. Um, so you are under complete control by the system and you cannot protest. So you cannot do activism. You cannot go on the web and start whining about conditions because then secret police would pick you up. Uh, then churches, the communists, uh, alienated many Poles by persecuting the Catholic Church. Um, so they had certain plans to divide the Catholic movement, promote a communist rule-friendly collaborationist church. We also saw that in Soviet Eastern Germany, the father of um, the previous uh, chancellor, Angela Merkel, her father, uh, Mr. Kassner, he had the job of bringing the church under control, not the Catholic Church, uh, 
though, but it was the same template. So they, they knew they couldn't destroy the church overnight, but they did it incrementally. Um, and that's how that went. Um, yeah, maybe I should mention the Khartoum mass Massacre. Um, so Russia back then killed thousands of Polish officers and, and other uh, officials. The Russians pretended to not know what happened to them and later blamed the Nazis for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, they brought these people to special places and special trains. Uh, these holes were dug, you know, with, with heavy machinery. And then um, the Russian... Uh, the the Russians they used German the, the Russians used German pistols and even German ammunition they used Geico bullets you can still buy Geico bullets to this very day by the way uh, so they I made didn't realize that they used German bullets um, and it was forty thousand Polish officers captured at the end of the invasion of Poland. The Germans had invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, and the Russians invaded on, I think it was the 11th of September. Uh, or no, it wasn't the 11th, it was the 18th. Um, and so Poland got smashed from both sides, and, and a bunch of these officers, 40,000 of them, ended up in uh, Russian hands. And the Russians, Stalin decided these were, you know, officers are educated people, part of the intelligentsia, uh, so Stalin wanted to eliminate them. So, uh, and of course they tried to frame the Germans and in World War II, it was convenient for the allies to say that it was the, the Germans were responsible, even though the Germans found the bodies, found the massacre and, tr and brought in the Red Cross to verify this had happened during the, the, the time when the Soviets had taken over that part of Poland. And, um, yeah, when, yeah. Uh, but, but, but of course soon the, uh, the Nazis, and the Nazis and the Soviets, they, uh, they, they had a falling out. So um, in June of 1941, Stalin, Stalin wanted to create a new Polish army, a uh, Polish army to fight the Nazis. But, you know, all these officers were dead. They were lying in these mass graves. And so these um, Polish officials desperately tried to find these officers they were listed as missing and and they also kept asking the russians do you know where these people are and the russians said no we just we can't find them you know they were there one moment and poof they were gone um and so um and so that's when the germans found these uh mass graves and they tried to make a big you know pr stunt um out of that well, it created quite a crisis. There's a, if you, I read a couple of years ago, the Maisky Diaries came out and was translated. Maisky was the Soviet ambassador to Great Britain and knew Churchill and all these other people. And of course, Churchill wanting to be an, a, a um, faithful ally of Stalin and the Soviet Union refused to believe the report that the Soviets had killed the 40,000 Polish officers. And of course, the Polish had a government in exile in London at the time. And they were, of course, greatly exercised over it, the fact that the, the, the allies were allied with Stalin. And uh, Churchill even went into a cabinet meeting intent on defending Moscow from this crime. And every one of his cabinet ministers sat there grimly, no, Winston, no, the Soviets <laughs> did do this. And, the, and they said, we can't publicize it. We can't talk about it, but amongst ourselves, we have to admit this is what the Russians did. And well, uh, well, even well. at Nuremberg, they allowed the Germans to be accused at Nuremberg of this massacre. Interesting. Well, um, it took until 1989, you know, for the truth to come out slowly. And so then yeah. fast, fast forward to the year 2010, uh, quite a few high-ranking, very high-ranking Polish um, officials, they died in a plane crash near Smolensk. They wanted to visit there to pay respect to the victims of the Katun massacre. It was a big commemoration, big commemoration of yeah. the event. 
And so you this know, plane, yeah. this plane like exploded, crashed. We can't tell really for sure because the Russians, um, they took over the investigation, violating uh, Putin. international law. Putin was in yeah. charge of the investigation. Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Putin. Violating international law, not really handing over enough evidence and, you know, not really handing over the bodies quickly and everything. So, I mean, this was, I mean, this was such a shock back then, but this was 20. 2010 this is when everybody still wanted to play nice with the russians so no big deal was made out of it if the same thing happened today we'd have world war three on the same day um but no everybody tried to play this down in 2010 so uh donald tusk played it down angela merkel yes. played it down um and uh yeah interestingly both have uh you know a sort of a interesting weird polish history now there's been accusations against Donald Tusk, you know, this is really murky. Angela Merkel, she grew up in the Soviet system and she apparently really liked the Soviet system. Nobody could really explain why she became so um, successful in, you know, German politics after re reunification. Yeah, so this was, um, this is how it's done. So you can expect the same in America, you can expect the same in, in any other place in the world that comes under Russian control, these, these post- take over cleanup operations um and so then uh, obviously for a while after takeover um the new system will control all media completely and they will not allow any shred of activism they will you know they they, they will allow some activism and some other media um over time but right after the takeover the control is total. And then these new surveillance systems are being built. And once these new systems are in place, that's when they, you know, uh, uh, they, they allow people to do things because they can find anybody who creates any trouble. And so people should be aware of the current state of Russian surveillance and also what they've, what they've done in the past because their methods never truly never truly changed um so uh we have data from roscom roscom nadzor it's the government censorship organization in there in russia um and we have numbers for the year 2022 they received almost 300,000 tips from citizens um about publishing illegal stuff on the internet or doing something else that was illegal, such as being against the war in Ukraine, um, being against the government, wanting change. You know, th this gets reported from by citizens. So we have 300,000 reports. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and this is when, when you're being watched on the subway, any train, any bus, if you have a certain patch on your jacket or your, your backpack, you know, and this, this patch is suspicious, they will report you. They will shoot a photo of you with their cell phone um, and then tell the government about you. So if you're a grandmother or if you're a teenager, if you're not really that dangerous, uh, you get a fine. Uh, they will fine you. You will pay money. Um, but it's on your record. So if you want to apply for a higher job, if you want to apply to university, if you want to move up in the in the system, this stuff is on your record. So if they pull up your file and you have several of these entries in your file, they will not trust you. Uh, so you don't have a career, basically. Uh, and also this... This reporting system is just a hotbed of corruption. So, for example, if somebody doesn't like you, um, if you if you think somebody is corrupt, if you think somebody does something, uh, this person can report you for something. Uh, or somebody is an informant and is in it for the money, not for you know loyalty to the system. Somebody is just in it for the money. Somebody could frame you. Somebody could. Um, accuse you of something and and somebody makes makes a, a statement against you this could could happen even though you didn't even protest the government 
Um, there's um, there's also something to be said in what to do when the Russians come. There's a part about organized crime and regular crime. <clears throat> you 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 have surprisingly when the communists or when the Russians first take over an area, crime shoots up because they're more or less looking at the honest citizens to see which ones are loyal and disloyal. So the, 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 and, and they will actually incorporate local bandits. If those bandits have uh, the right political orientation are very sophisticated politically, they can actually make them part of the administrative organization of the country. Uh, and then there's all these youth because of so many um, children's parents are killed there's a, a lot of wild young people on the loose committing crimes. So there'll be muggings and robberies and murders and so on. And the, the authorities aren't, you know, they'll, they'll get to that, but they're not immediately concerned with that. Um, it's kind of an interesting picture of how crime works under, under yeah. a uh, Russian occupation. Yeah, and as I mentioned before, um, back in those days, uh, even in Soviet Eastern Germany, um, in those days, if you were a suspect and, and the government didn't really know yet if you were in contact with this person and that person, um, in, in during the investigation, they could um, put a radioactive needle into your jacket uh, so they can check with a Geiger counter whether you're close or not. Uh, they could also, uh, they could also um, contaminate a... Uh, you know, currency, you know, paper, uh, paper currency. And so we, we have a lot of data now about the, the Stasi, uh, the Stasi operations. So um, on average, a citizen per year gets about four millisievert um, of, of radioactive, um, uh, of radioactive radiation. Okay, four millisievert is considered normal. A, uh, a a a a paper currency, you know, a single bill that was contaminated on purpose to track it. One bill uh, gave you two hundred rem. That's four sievert. So you're supposed to be getting four millisievert per year, but this thing gives you four sievert. So they don't care if you get cancer from this. Um, they just wanted to track you. Uh, so this is how. This is how they worked, and um, uh, so th they did this with paper documents as well. There was an engineer in, in Germany, an engineer who was under suspicion, and so the Stasi would um, the Stasi would make sure that this person received radioactive documents, um, and this guy then took those documents and gave them to a man from West Berlin. And uh, so the radiation was so crazy on those papers, the Stasi noted in a report, we could track the radiation from outside of the building with a Geiger counter. So just so people are aware of, um, of uh, how these people work. Um, and so for, for quite a while, this was before, especially before 2022, the Ukrainian invasion, for years... Um, we've heard these influencers talk about the situation in Russia and make it sound nicer than it was. We often heard the argument, as long as you don't agitate against the government, you can say whatever you want. You can hate gay people, you can hate foreigners, you can say this and you can say that. And you could, of course, say negative things about the West, as long as you didn't totally attack the government, you know, in front of other people, as long as you didn't do any activism like that, you were perfectly fine. Um, but that's not, that's not really true. Because a lot of the time in Russia over the last couple of years, a lot of the times these protests or, or this activism was not so much about revolution in Russia, toppling the government, you know, aggressive type plans, but it was more like, why don't we have central heating? Why is um, the heating broken in the winter? Why do these hospitals not have running hot water? Why is the medical treatment so low quality? Why is this problem there? Why is that problem there? Oftentimes, these people just want problems fixed. They don't want to 
turn over the system. They just want a specific problem fixed or they want a certain candidate to run for office, local office, to maybe solve some of these problems. But even those people get hunted. And so they don't make much of a difference. Uh, yeah, one of the things that's in what to do when the Russians come is that the phone service will disintegrate. It will get progressively worse so that you can't reliably reach anybody by phone. And of course, when you do talk on the phone, you may be listened to. Right? Yeah. You're gonna be you're gonna be listened to in real time. And you need permission for anything. Are. Yeah. 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 And the same thing with getting a car and the cars break down. You're gonna get awful car cars, no regular service. People get gonna have to do for themselves. And it's um in fact one of the things they say that people that are immediately caught in a communist country, middle class people, they fall they can easily fall into a depression in which they're not sure they want to go on living. Yeah. And of course, most people get get past that, but that's how horrible you feel in yourself when you lose your yeah. freedom, when you lose your opportunity, <clears throat> and and life becomes this this yeah. slavery, this drudgery. And, and for a while, people, um, people just retreated in Russia. Okay, so they accepted that newspapers were being shut down. They accepted that. Gazprom would take over all these television stations. They accepted. Um, that mainstream media was under total control because they thought, well, we still have the internet. Then the, uh, the, the, the SORM system was installed. So every internet service provider has these rooms and devices run by the FSB. So the FSB can listen in, on, in, into anything and they can read messages. And that's when people started to say, well, we still have uh, VPNs and encrypted chat apps uh signal whatsapp okay so they retreated so far that the only thing they had left was this this encrypted type stuff on the internet but when you have a system like sorum everywhere they can do deep packet inspections so they can do things that um they 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 these systems look into these individual data packages where they're going where they're from and you are automatically a suspect if you use these services and also at some point you cannot even use these services any longer okay so the only thing left to retreat to is sort of the old school tradecraft right where you just share things on paper and you have dead drops or you make like a, a chalk signal uh, that looks inconspicuous so somebody else sees the signal and they know there's a drop-off at the dead drop. So you can use old-school um, uh, tradecraft. The problem is, in the big cities in Russia, there are these cameras everywhere, surveillance cameras, like hundreds of thousands of these things. So they can trail you while you go from place to place to meet somebody or pick up a message. And by the way, this, this uh, facial recognition technology now makes the surveillance state all the more powerful. Um, when I worked in government, I saw this uh, technology, and it, what it does is it, it will identify a face, the computer will, and it'll put like a box around your face, and it will look at your facial features, and if you're in the record, it will, your name will come up. Yeah. It will identify you. And the Russians, so that's why the cameras everywhere is very important, because if you're, even, it's incredible, even the definition at a distance, it can identify people. And you can see where someone is or where they have been, yeah. which is terrifying because it's it's a form of surveillance done by computers. And as AI gets more sophisticated, it means that somebody could just talk to, you know, we talk to our phone now, Siri. Um, but uh, if, if you've got an Apple iPhone, but the some intelligence official can go, um, tell me where so-and-so has gone today. Tell me what they've been. Who have they been with? today yeah. and it instantly comes up yeah and also they can do searches not for not only for an individ individual person but they can ask the system tell me or show me anybody who is behaving in a suspicious manner because it's an algorithm they surveil all kinds of normal people so they figure out what's a normal behavioral pattern okay this person wakes up 
uh, goes to work, stops for a coffee, comes back from work, or maybe goes to a store, gets home, sits in front of his television, or you know, web-based internet television. So you can always trace and and understand normal behavior. Now, once you deviate from that sort of behavior, the system can mark you as uh, suspicious, and that's when physical human agents can start trailing you. Now, of course, having physical assets. Um, that's expensive and 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 but um of course we know about the soviet union how many domestic assets they had they almost had too many uh kgb assets and and if you wanted to join the kgb the goal was always to get a foreign posting to to be in london to be in Ber- west berlin to be in in you know in washington because that's when you could enjoy life uh you didn't have to live in russia and you could just make money on the side right um, but if you were a domestic KGB agent in Russia, you would just hunt these average dissidents or you would just um, chase some foreigners, you know, and just, just follow them around everywhere. You know, this was not a well-paid job necessarily if you worked for the KGB uh, in within Russia, okay? Um, So, um, yeah, some people believe that you can always evade with these technological options and these apps and these devices, but um, uh, you can embed this stuff so deeply that there's literally no way to escape the digital surveillance. And uh, if if you know traditional spycraft, you could try that. Um, but um, yeah, the Russians they they wrote a few pages uh, of the special, you know, traditional spycraft playbook. So you are battling experts, and if you're not an expert and you're battling experts who have a lot of resources, you will eventually lose. Okay. And also, if you want to talk to people, if you want to work with people, how do you know these people are not informants? You think your buddy will go to prison instead of selling you out okay and and imagine if if this russian occupation goes on for 10 years and 20 years at some point people get fatigued they don't want to rebel they just want to want to go along and they just uh they will report on anybody virtually yeah we talked about the death lists and in suvarov's information about west germany having 600,000 which is about 1% of the population but in the uh, wider levels of arrests uh in what to do when the russians come they talk about 25% of the population of the united states would end up in camps if if there was this kind of and i think that would be true for any given country if you go to europe or canada or anywhere else. And so here's a list they compiled of the people that the Russians typically arrest when they take control of a territory. All former former officials of the state, the army, and the judiciary, all former registered members of non-communist political parties, in, in America in that case it would not include the Democratic Party, all active members of student organizations, members of the National Guard, refugees from Russia, representatives of foreign firms, employees and former employees of foreign legations firms and companies, the clergy, people in contact with foreign countries, including philatelists, people who collect stamps, and espanterists, the people who believe in this language they invented for universal use around the world, landowners, merchant bankers, business people, owners of hotels and restaurants, shopkeepers, and former Red Cross officials. So those would be the top people on the list to be arrested. Yeah, and of course they take your stuff. You know, the, the, they take your car, they take your house. So you live. If if you're lucky, you get to live in a in a you know crappy apartment. But you know, Sergey and Igor will get your house if if you have one or had one. And uh, yeah, so um, if we talk about um, oh, and also one more point I wanted to add to this is um, some people may say, well. If I cooperate with the system and they really like me, then I don't have anything to worry about. I get rewarded if I work for the new system. Well, here's the catch. You still have memory of the, you know, memories of the past. You know what America used to be. So, um, and the Russians don't like that. So eventually they might target you for no good reason because that's what happened in the Soviet Union over and over again. 
Um, they don't fully trust you. They would rather take the the next guy, the younger guy, and uh, and and <clears throat> just destroy you, and have the younger guy who is completely fully indoctrinated. So this younger guy takes your position <clears throat> because this younger guy doesn't have memories of what it was like before. You know, he he doesn't know what America really was like. So he does. The younger guy doesn't have that sense of disappointment, and that maybe that sense of uh, resentment, right? Um, because you know what it would be a risk to the Russians if they teach you things. You know, if they give you a position, um, why would they do that for a longer time? You know, they can just replace you because it's safer for for the Russian system. So cooperating doesn't necessarily protect you. Just so people understand that. Um, now let's talk about prisons and mental institutions. <clears throat> so uh, the Stasi, for example, would grab you off the street or at night. Uh, sometimes they would even indicate beforehand that they are going to grab you. So you live in this constant terror. You don't know what's going to happen to you, your family. You know, will your kids end up in a horrible, um, you know, uh, institution? Yeah, you they just, favor night arrests. They yeah. fi- favor banging down your door in the middle of the night. And there's a specific reason for that. The people, when they're woken up in a groggy state, aren't necessarily able to think very carefully about what to do and how to defend themselves. Yeah. And so the next stage would be um, they will put you in a holding cell, uh, a holding cell by yourself for weeks in isolation and they will expect you to just sit there in silence day after day no sensory input um you cannot talk to anybody you don't know what the charges are what they charge you with you don't get to see a lawyer you cannot contact your family um you don't get to watch television you don't get to read newspapers nothing you are completely out of this world and so after a couple of weeks, you are already pretty much insane. And they um, will use torture. For example, yeah. they'll use sleep deprivation. They've got this thing where they, they take a bed frame, a metal bed, bed frame, they handcuff you to it, they make you lie on it, and then they run electricity through it. So they shock yeah, you. They have- Another one, I think it's called the elephant, where they, make, they put a gas mask on you and they fill the gas mask with um, tear gas. Yeah. That's another form of torture. There are different different stages and levels of this. Now I mentioned these um, these Stasi examples because they had to be more careful with all of that because there was always the risk that information would leak from you know Soviet uh, Eastern Germany to the West. So they were not using the fullest extent of of their uh, capabilities. They were not using all of it in that particular. Uh, country, but of course, in in other regions, when there was no chance of things ever leaking, they would devise any sort of uh, torture method you could possibly think of. Now, um, um, so after weeks of isolation and or various forms of torture, the endless interrogation sessions begin. So. In Soviet Russia, they could just beat you with a rubber hose until you sign a confession. In Germany, it was it was a bit more more elegant, uh, but still, you know, brutal and crazy. And then you sign a confession. You get a sham court date, where your lawyer, court, you know, government appointed lawyer, has nothing really to say. Uh, he can make a small appeal and say a bunch of stuff, but it has no meaning whatsoever. The moment you are indicted in a Russian-controlled system, conviction is pretty much guaranteed. I think um, nowadays the Russians have a 99% conviction rate. Okay? And um, so, yeah, you get a sentence in front of a sham court, and then you get either executed or you go to prison or in a hard labor camp or a a psychiatric institution now i wanted to mention this according to karl marx 
According to Karl Marx, different classes of people had different structures in their minds. So Marx declared the bourgeoisie to be mentally defective because they were inherently unable to comprehend Marx's theories. Uh, since they were, in a sense, insane, there was no valid reason for communists to waste time arguing with these people. It was called psychopathological mechanisms of dissent. Uh, the anti-Soviet political behavior of some individuals um, were defined as criminal acts, symptoms of mental illness, and susceptible of a ready-made diagnosis they call, or we call it, sluggish schizophrenia. Andropov, Andropov was in charge of the deployment of psychiatric repression from the moment he was appointed to head the KGB, became KGB chairman in uh, 1967. Okay, so um, this is these are the options that these people um, these people have. So they can sentence you to 30 days. In a mental institution. And they will medically torture you and use other forms of torture. And then they, they use drugs. Yeah, and use, yeah, they use drugs and they shove you out on the street. So you are a warning to others and you will never misbehave ever again. So again, there's there's different methods to uh, to, to use here. I have a study here. It's called uh, Psychiatry as a Tool for coercion in post-Soviet countries. Okay, not Soviet era, post-Soviet era. And it says here, in some of the former Soviet republics, notably in the Russian Federation and most of the Central Asian republics, the old nomenklatura maintained its power base, effectively keeping post-Soviet psychiatry under their control and free from Western influence. When, after the assumption of Vladimir Putin to power in the year 2000 or 99, the political climate in the Russian Federation started to deteriorate, uh, deteriorate, local officials felt it was possible again to revert to old mechanisms of subduing bothersome citizens by scaring them off with the psychiatric threat. Yeah, in fact, I knew a woman who was w knew things about the apartment bombings back in 1999 in September. And she was uh, actually made the mistake of saying some things on the internet, and she was they were trying to put her in a psychiatric institution. She had to flee Russia. She had to get out of the country because they were going to institutionalize yeah. her. Yeah. Um, yeah. It says the key issue is that the reform movement in mental health had only a limited impact and did not manage to alter the situation in mental health fundamentally. Many of the mental health institutions remained in human environments and places where many human rights abuses were a daily occurrence, while the level of psychiatric care was far from acceptable. Um, in St. Petersburg, Ivan Ivanikov, who lectured for 38 years at the State University of Economics and Finance, found himself wrestled to the ground, handcuffed and dragged to the city psychiatric hospital in December of two 2003 after a protracted dispute with a well-connected contractor over repairs to his apartment. An influential state psychiatrist signed the recommendation for commitment without ever having met Ivanikov, deciding that his multiple legal complaints against the contractor constituted an obsession with revenge. He was released after 60 days. So imagine, you want to comply with the system the new rule you want to you know just not rebel against the system but then you have a dispute about something but but this person has connections you know you just you, you make some russian guy angry and you find yourself in a mental institution in the fall of 2005 a human rights activist from Cheb Boksari Albert Vasilievich Imendayev decided to run for the legislature. He was required to appear at the local election commission to finalize his candidacy when an investigator from the prosecutor's office met him at the courthouse with three police officers. They kept him locked up until a judge could be found to sign the order committing him for a psychiatric evaluation. He was sent straight to the psychiatric hospital. By the time he was released nine days later, the election filing deadline has passed and he was out of the race. 
Imendaev's quote, act of insanity had been filing a series of legal complaints against local officials, police, prosecutors, and judges, alleging corruption, violation of court procedures, and cronyism. The prosecutor, a frequent target of Imendaev's complaints, called his behavior paranoia. Now, of course, in, in any such system, they will publicly say it's possible to complain, it's possible, we have rule of law, we have a constitution that guarantees you all these rights, so of course you can complain, but the moment you complain, this is what happens to you. Yeah, uh, you get into trouble there. In, yeah, it's like the um, let a thousand flowers blossom in, in uh, communist China, uh, and this is what um, uh, the, the fellow who wrote uh, Bitter Winds uh, wrote, um, um, he was, he was a college student. He thought he was allowed to protest because they said, now we're going to let you criticize the communist party. And guess what? All the people they criticized the communist party, their names were written down and they were arrested later. Yeah. And that's how it worked. Yeah. And there's, there's, um, it's, th this was apparently, um, this was apparently even a mechanism under the Russian czars where sometimes they would pretend to to loosen up, so so they would embolden the dissidents, and then they could watch. Okay, who of the dissidents is really going to do something? And that's when more repressions happen, and then they can loosen up a bit and see who's doing something, and then repeat that cycle over and over. In another case, in Cheboksari, a four-term opposition deputy in the regional parliament uh, parliament. Igor Molyakov spent six months in jail on libel charges in 2004. While incarcerated, he was sent for psychiatric hospitalization after a judge agreed with government lawyers that Molyakov's repeated writings about corruption among local authorities reflected an outlook so somber that it might constitute a mental disorder. Again, this is post-Soviet. This, this was 2004. Okay, This is not 19... 64 or something. Uh, it just goes on and on. In the same period, Natalia Kuznetsova was dismissed from a position at the audit office of the Russian Federation after she openly asserted that in 2001 and 2002, some 140 million US dollars were stolen from the state budget. Again, she's not calling for a revolution and a violent overthrow. She's just saying there's this money is being stolen. A state psychologist issued a statement that she was suffering from mental health problems. When finally they dismissed me from my job, she stated they threatened to call an ambulance to take me immediately to a psychiatric hospital for forced treatment. Next, August 2012, it appeared that in the case of Pussy Riot, this was this was these these weirdo activists with their mask, you know, masks. You they know, desecrated something in a churches. church and yeah, then yeah, got sent to doing jail these, this in weird, Siberia weird, for a weird term, dance yeah. in the church. The defendants had all been examined psychiatrically by psychiatrists um, from the uh, psychiatric hospital outside Moscow, an institution that in Soviet times was heavily implicated in the political abuse of psychiatry. And of course, it's it's not it's not a fun place to grow up. I mean, you know, you can rightfully complain you know about desecrating churches but what kind of life did these young women what kind of life did they have you know what made them the way they are right um according to the psychological and psychiatric report the three women suffered from personality disorders and the, thus should be isolated from society the experts did not appear in court could not be questioned by the defense the language used in the report sounded very familiar to the qualifications used in Soviet times when diagnosing dissidents. Some victims emerged from psychiatric hospital physically permanently damaged, others were mentally destroyed. And of course, we should also mention um, the use of provocateurs, you know, by Russian intelligence. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can do yes. that everywhere. So they will encourage you to do this and then the next thing and then the next thing and then they arrest every one of you um yeah some people died in s these psychiatric hospitals um and uh it says the violation in psych of psychiatric patients rights in ukraine years ago um is in most cases caused by opportunistic material reasons apartments houses and other property of psychiatric patients are taken away by relatives 
or by organized criminal groups that have the legal status of commercial enterprises and stand in direct contact with local authorities and police precincts. So they just take your stuff. Unfortunately, some lawyers and psychiatrists also participate in these illegal activities. Now, if you don't end up in a psychiatric institution, if it's just a, quote, normal prison, um, things can still be very, very crazy. Now, this was a fairly recent leak. Uh, leak. Uh, this was posted on gulagu.net. Um, this was reported in the Moscow Times and many other uh, publications. So um, there were thousands of video clips uh, stolen from Russian prisons. And so you could see on these uh, video files abuse of um, prisoners, torture of prisoners, and extortion. So, for example, they will force you to sign a confession that makes no sense. Uh, They will force you to implicate somebody else that is innocent. And they will extort money out of your relatives. If they don't pay up, you get tortured in prison or they prolong your prison sentence, actually. And there's also some uh, indications that sometimes these prisons actually rent you out to sadistic people who will pay tens of thousands of dollars to torture somebody. You, for uh, in that case. So just some, some sadist who wants to torture somebody and he gets to pay a prison to do so. And the, the, the prison guards, these, these prison people, they get the money. They, they make $30,000, $50,000 from one such You know, uh, I, I, should, uh, I should add, you know, people thought the gulag ended with the Soviet Union. And it's simply not true. Uh, Abraham Shifrin, who wrote the guidebook, he was a Soviet defense official who defected to Israel. He wrote the guidebook to camps. Uh, I think it's, that's what it's called, the guidebook to camps and prisons in the Soviet Union. Uh, after the Years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, he gave an interview to Christopher Story in which he said, look, the camp system is operating like it has always operated. It is, it is still functioning. It's been hidden. They've hidden it in places. And I, I met a businessman who worked to create the, um, you know, the um, ATM machines across Kazakhstan where they mine the titanium for the Russian submarines. And, um, and of course, they had the workers there. And, and I, I did this interview with him some years ago, and he said that he was in Alma-Ata, and he heard about that there was this gulag in this giant series of buildings on one side of town. And he thought, you know, I'm going to go and check it out. And he got a chauffeur to drive him there. He went up to the building and knocked. And he almost got arrested for doing this. Uh, but he did see that it was, a pr- it was actually a prison, but it was hidden. And, of course, it was yeah. run by Russians in Kazakhstan. <clears throat> um, you had uh, – I, I met the, um, the guy that was uh, in the European – parliament they had uh, all the different countries in the european parliament had lists of political prisoners because there were people who had fled the soviet union in all these countries and they had relatives that were people they knew that were in the gulag after the fall of the soviet union this delegation from nato went to moscow to see the freeing of the political prisoners i forget what year it was 90 or 91 um and uh, it was John de la Brown, who was also a member of parliament. And what he told me was they went to Moscow, they get entertained, and they're waiting to go and see these prisoners liberated. Day after day passes. Now, all the Western newspapers had announced their trip and announced these yeah. prisoners were being freed. It was a done deal. But they get there, and then they finally they said to the Russian officials, what's the big deal? Oh, there's a hang-up. There's a problem with the airplanes. There's a problem with this or that. And eventually, after a week, you know, these people had to go back home and nothing happened. There was no the release of all these names didn't happen. And uh, when people went to the newspapers, like John de la Brana would say, like, this didn't happen. The newspapers were like, no, we're not going to go there. We're not going to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, you know, if if um, if an American, uh, you know, if an American now believes all this stuff on the internet and, you know, Tucker Carlson, Alex Jones and all that stuff that the Russians will liberate us from the, you know, oppression or the uh, occupation of the so-called globalists. It, if you believe that, okay, and, and you are 
you are an American. You are older than 50, maybe. Um, or you may be even older than 50. You are obese. You have high blood pressure. You may be getting cancer in the near future. Well, guess what? The Russians don't need you. Okay? And they, they don't need you. They don't need other people with the same problems. And especially the elderly. You know, people in their 70s and 80s. The Russians don't need them. And they don't spend any money on people they don't need. So there's all of that going on, especially in Germany. I mean, like, like these, I mean, people in East Germany right now, um, people in East Germany, uh, to a larger degree, believe all this nonsense propaganda. You know, the Russians will liberate them. Um, but um, these people in the East are very old. Oftentimes, and especially the, the extreme right wingers over there, they're very old. I mean, some. I mean, I think the average member of the AFD party and the average supporter is the average age is around sixty, I believe, or maybe even higher. The Russians. Is that right? Oh yeah, they're very old, very old people. Yeah. No kidding. Um, huh? And uh, and so the Russians don't need these people. I mean, in Germany overall. We have like, um, what is it? We have like 20 million people older than 60 or something. And, you know, we're an obese country and we have blood That's pressure. That's 25% of the population. Yeah, because that, that became a problem during COVID, by the way, um, because we have so many old people. There's not enough children. And... Um, uh, and that's also due to Russian Russian influence, you know, the left influence during the Cold War. We don't have enough children. There's very many old people and their health is not good. So they have blood pressure, heart problems, um, cancer, this and that. The Russians don't need this. They don't need you. If you cost them money, they would rather let you die. And, and so this is also something that people need to be aware of um, in case they ever consider getting under Russian control. Um, yeah, so when that scandal ca came out with the videos from the Russian prisons, um, the Kremlin was responding in public. And they said, yeah, we are aware of these, this footage and we have started an investigation and I think somebody lost his job maybe. But for the leak, not for the actions, not for, you know, selling prisoners to sadists or extorting money from the relatives of prisoners, actually. Um, yeah, and so um, uh, gulagu.net, the website, was, um, was saying there are four main categories of victims. Some prisoners are being pressured to make statements against other people that are not true. Um, sometimes it's sexual exploitation of prisoners and, uh, and, and, you know, th these, these kind of categories. Um, and, um, yeah, and of course, I mean, there's some people, I mean, that, that baffled me always. I mean, when I, I mean, because I, I read so much literature about the Soviet Union and, and, you know, the dissidents in the Soviet Union and some of these people, they were blissfully unaware of, of what they were getting into. I mean, they, they had this idea that you could do activism and then you can do activism in prison and ha have these letters and smuggle out letters and get international recognition. I mean, they had no idea how easy it was to break them in prison. I mean, it, it's remarkably easy. I mean, any moron can do this. And of course, a lot of these um, for older KGB guys, domestic KGB guys used for this type of stuff, a lot of these KGB guys were not really smart. They used the smarter ones for, you know, complicated operations in the West. Um, but um, this is what this is what what the system was. Um, now, do you have anything more about this particular aspect of Russian rule, the prisons? Because um, I'm at the end of my notes about this aspect. Well, yeah. The, well, like what I said before, the Gulag is still in operation, although it's the velvet. Uh, you know, the, the iron fist and the velvet glove. Um, one of the things I might point out is like with the Nord Ost situation. Remember that Nord Ost where there were a bunch of supposed Chechen Islamic fanatic terrorists who took over the theater and they used some kind of gas that killed a lot of the actual hostages in the theater. And they yeah. were rigged with bombs. 
Well, um, Anna Polikovskia did a lot of research in that, and it turns out that these people, they were in the Gulag, they were uh, Chechens in the Gulag, who were actually serving sentences that were supposedly going on when they did their terrorism. And the story, the real story was that these people got told to leave prison and go do this operation and then they would be allowed to be freed, yeah. right? This is the story. And, and it was later, um, believe it or not, the Russian who helped organize it, who was associated with this, who supposedly died in the siege, Anna Polikovskia ran into him in Europe on a Russian, I'm going from memory now, he was on a, a some kind of Russian representative board in some deal in Europe. I think it was in Germany somewhere. Maybe it was in Luxembourg. And she said, oh my gosh, you were involved with this Nordost and you're supposed to be dead. And he said, oh no, it was an operation. I'm not dead, you know. Mm -hmm. I and mean, this is one of the reasons that Apolikovsky got a bullet, right? Yeah. It was like the whole event was fabricated and they just, they used gulag prisoners, just the same way Hitler used concentration camp prisoners, mm -hmm. yeah. gave them Polish uniforms at that radio station that he created, staged that event before he invaded Poland, that Poland did attack the German radio station. I forget the name of the place where that happened. You, you may know the name of it, but, and then, then there were German leaders. It's in the it's in the memoirs of uh, Walter Schellenberg, for example, and it's talked about by some of the witnesses at Nuremberg. Um, this thing that they did, but they would actually stage an event using prisoners. So prisoners are expendable, and of course now you know that um, with the Wagner mercenary group, they were recruiting people from the prisons to fight in the Wagner mm -hmm. as a Wagner mercenary. And of course, in the, the old gulag, it was the political prisoners, the Zeks, were the lowest, you know, the, the criminals were put above them and yeah. could kick them around. Um, and I think that there were a number of cosmetic releases of political prisoners uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, and, and people from internal exile like Sakharov and his wife. Um, but, but in reality, many of these people were kept. And then you go to what happened to Navalny in prison on the Arctic Circle, how he died. Um, they say, you know, he was punched in the chest and he had a heart injury from being poisoned. That may be true or not. You know, I'm always skeptical of these stories because they always yeah. exist. But uh, the number of prisoners, we don't even know what these numbers are. But I met, I was on a television program with a American judge uh, lawyer judge who had gone to Russia. This was in around the year 2001. He had worked in Russia in the 90s trying to reform the judicial system. And off camera, I was discussing with him what he, he was trying to be diplomatic on camera and not really say how bad it was. And I realized this uh, and I, you know, I spoke to him and he said, he said, look, they can't change their system. It's Soviet. The judges yeah. are politically appointed. They know who they're responsible to. And if they say, send this guy to prison, if the judge, he knows cases of judges that tried to be honest and the judges ended up in prison, right? Yeah. I mean, the. You can't, ref it's not reformable. Yeah. I mean, the, um, I remember Anne Applebaum's book on the Gulag system, I think that came out a few years ago. Now, I, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a scientific book. It's it's decent, um, and she made the point that others had made before um, that nobody is truly free in a Russian or Soviet system. So even when you're not in a actual prison, you still live under prison-like um, conditions. So it's always just a, yeah. a matter of what what degree of prison status do you have it's not like you're in or out prison you're always inside of some kind of a prison system uh, and also um the chinese will harvest your organs so if a communist oh, yes. high-ranking communist needs a new liver you will have an accident or they will list you as an accident you fell down some stairs or whatever and they, they just take your liver I and, I also um, should mention that there are elderly Vietnam War era uh, prisoners that are believed to still be in the Gulag in Russia. And there's been stories, uh, the late Joe Douglas wrote a book about this, 
Um, the Russians, we know from defector testimony, Jan Shana in particular, that the Russians moved, took a certain percentage of prisoners from the Vietnam War. For example, I think if I'm remembering right, um, um, some of them, you know, they, they, if they had technical knowledge of things the Russians were interested in, or they took them as test subjects as guinea pigs in experiments, because they sometimes they wanted Amer the American physique to actually conduct experiments to see how radiation or certain biological yeah. weapons or chemical weapons would f affect an American. So these kind of things would go on within the Gulag. And of course, as in China and North Korea, where they have hospitals where they you know, conduct biological warfare experiments on prisoners. And you can bet this is going on in China big time. Yeah. The Russians also were doing this. So the, that you, there isn't, the, the prisoner rights are sort of a myth in a way. They pretend to respect the rights and the laws, but it really doesn't work that way. Yeah. I mean, um, after, after our show about, um, Dugin and, and the, the occultists, um, I read a book on the uh, I read a book on the German um, uh, Nazi Ahnen Albe project. I should have read this before the show, but I just re just rediscovered that in my own library after the show. Um, and so um, the Ahnen Albe was not just a an occult project; it was also about um, biological and chemical. Uh, weapons research. So this was tied into all these these different products. And they were testing stuff out on prisoners, really. Um, and so, um, yeah, it was just shoving people into a specific cell. And then the person in charge would use these glass capsules, smash them on the floor and quickly close the door. Um, and um, there was constant there was constant communication between these these officials about needing new prisoners. And then they were complaining about the quality of prisoner material. They always call call the material um, because um, most of these prisoners they received for these experiments they were malnourished. So the complaint from the scientists um, was that this is not a realistic experiment because we want to know how a healthy German or a healthy whatever would react. And you giving us these skeleton prisoners, so please give us better prisoners. You know that sort of thing was was uh, rampant with Nazi Germany, and of course the Russians did the same thing. And also, um, um, when when the Stasi was done, people found these devices, these radio radiological devices um, that were used covertly on prisoners, especially dissidents. So the setup was like this: they would tell you they needed. You know, they needed photos, you know, prison photos of your face. So they would sit you on a specific chair and there was a, a, a sheet of fabric behind you, which looked like a, a normal backdrop. And you would sit there and have your photo taken. But behind the sheet, behind the curtain behind you was a radiological device that would just bombard you with radiation. And uh, we know that specific dissidents um, later developed these crazy cancers um, and that stuff can also be used out in the field so without having anybody in prison they can just they had a whole list I think it was called data talks um, there were like a thousand entries or more any substance that could make you ill or crazy um, or make you disabled in some form so you cannot concentrate you cannot work you're tired all the time so this is also something they can do so you're not in a physical regular prison um but then you are in a prison of your own body or in the prison of your own mind um and uh the well, government and that can brings claim up the that brings up the poisoning that goes way back um there's it's been written about that uh the death of george orwell for example he was in a sanitarium being treated for um, uh, consumption for um, Eric Arthur Blair. And what's that? Eric Arthur Blair, Orwell. Eric Arthur Blair, uh, George Orwell, who wrote Animal Farm and 1984. 84. Very. He was a socialist who realized that communism was evil, and of course, um, 
you know, some animals are more equal than others. Napoleon the pig who ran Animal Farm. Um, you, uh, he was really a scourge. He was really damaging to the Soviet cause, to the communist cause. To have a person who was a socialist, who had those kind of sensibilities to turn against them. And of course, he was supposedly cured. He was ready to leave his, I think it was his fiance, his girlfriend was coming to pick him up and she gets there and he's dead. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't make any sense. So people have written about that. The same thing with uh, Joseph McCarthy. He goes in with a, what was it? Uh, uh, he had a, uh, a problem with his leg or his back or something. He goes in and he dies of liver failure while he's in the hospital, right? So this is weird, and it's been, there's been essays and books written about this. And Audie Murphy, the famous American war hero who won the Congressional Medal of Honor fighting the Germans in World War II, both in Italy and in, in France, uh, France, Belgium. He was extremely famous as an actor. He became a Hollywood actor. He was a very patriotic uh, individual, um, and he got interested, uh, and he was pretty young, uh, he got interested in communism. I think he was around 40 years old. He got interested in communism. He thought it, it, that a proper anti-communist movement didn't exist, and he wanted to organize it. Yeah. And then he suddenly dies in a plane crash. Bang. Magic. Right? So you've got these very significant celebrity-type folks, you know, George Orwell, Joseph McCarthy, um, uh, and, of course, Audie Murphy, just as three names – off the top of my head, of prominent, strong anti-communists who were suddenly taken off the board before their yeah. time, um, very strangely, as it turns out. And I don't think those kind of things are accidental because they do the same thing to prominent people in uh, Russia. You know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn is is kind of a, an exception, and you you kind of wonder why. But they, he somehow lived. You know, he was released from internal yeah, probably exile Probably because the he was, maybe he was too famous. Uh, yeah, he might have been too famous. But also, if you talk to uh, Soviet people, people from that era, and I know a couple people that had them in their homes in the Soviet Union when he was on the loose there before they, they sent him, they kicked him out of the country. Um, he is not, modern Russians don't, relate well to him no. uh, because he is a kind of religious traditional yeah. Russian. So he writes in an old-fashioned style yeah. of Russian, like imagine an old-fashioned style of German, right? Or old English, you know, he writes in this I remember this kind the, of the left, style. even the yeah. left in Germany giving him crap for that, for being right-wing. Just make it yeah, all about and that. So he's, yeah, so they realized that he was anti-liberal like them, that he was part of this far right that they would one day maybe want to exploit to their benefit mm -hmm. um, because they were looking at their long range gaming that they were playing and that they'd used the far right. They'd used the Nazis and the extreme nationalists, anti-Semites and so on before. And of course, Solzhenitsyn had, had been accused of being an anti-Semite. And of course, if you read his 200 years together, uh, which has not been fully translated into English, you you see a very nuanced uh, history of the relationship between the Jews and the Russians. So he was uh, a very serious person, Solzhenitsyn. But who today in the mainstream West takes him seriously, right? Yeah. He was never the same kind of threat that a George Orwell or that a popular politician like McCarthy or a famous movie star like Audie Murphy, even worse, right, yeah. in this age of the cinema. <clears throat> would be a threat. In, so uh, yeah, maybe he think, didn't rise to that level of threat. Yeah. Right? I, I spoke earlier about when you collaborate with a system and you work for the system, um, but you still have memories of the old days. This was something that played a large part in the 1984 novel because the main character still has these memories and he knows he can compare what what the government is saying right now. He can compare it to his childhood or his his early um, days when he was young, and that made him that made him dangerous um, because he he could still remember and and obviously a Russian system um, a Russian system can play games with um, healthcare. Okay, so you can see that all the place in Russia when COVID happened. 
uh, rich Russians kept buying all of these ventilation machines. So the modern type ventilation machines, uh, because the Russian government, they had stockpiled these older type ventilation machines, I think a large number, I don't exactly remember what the number was. So there are these these older mechanical types, you know, not not microprocessor controlled and everything. But uh, so they still stockpile those for, you know, a biological war. But these rich Russians, they would just buy the new fancy machines and take them off the market. And of course, if if you are a a player in the system nowadays in Russia, you get good health care. Um, you will be treated um, either inside of Russia or you just fly to another country, get treated there and then fly back. But it's not the same for the general population. And and if anybody comes under Russian control, you know, on American soil, European soil, you can expect these games to be played with um, healthcare. You know, if the system doesn't like you or they just don't, they don't need you, um, good luck getting, you know, adequate health care. Right. And, uh, well, but, well, yeah, it's rationed. Healthcare into that system is rationed. Um, and then there's the people that are poisoned by the system, uh, Navalny being one who had to get treatment in Germany. Um, but you had also, you had um, uh, Viktor Yashchenko, who was uh, uh, poisoned with dioxin uh, during the presidential race in 2004, led to the... Uh, the orange revolution. Um, and I actually spoke to the doctor years ago that treated him. It was an American doctor. He, he had to, he had to be treated outside of Ukraine, just like Navalny did to get the proper treatment. And of course it's very, it, 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 it pockmarked his face, Yushchenko's yeah. face. It, it uh, greatly damaged his health. And of course, uh, what one Polish journalist who spent time interviewing in private Yushchenko's wife is that, is that, is that, that the wife was able to express the terror that they felt as a family, as a couple, about this event, how vulnerable you are. And of course, what a lot of people don't know is that uh, the po they believe the poisoning of Yushchenko took place at a dinner at which the deputy head of the SBU, that's formerly the Ukrainian yeah. KGB, yeah. was present, and he was believed the one to poison him because afterwards he fled to Moscow where he was given asylum and they would not, the Russians wouldn't allow the Ukrainians to extradite him as a suspect in the poisoning of the man who became Ukraine's president uh, out of the 2004 elections ultimately. And that's just one example of poisoning. But another example of poisoning with the health system, the Kalashnikovs. And there was a Dutch documentary made about the Kalashnikovs and I knew them. Uh, Victor did work for my website, jrnyquist.com, my previous one. And, uh, and gave me a lot of insights. He was a KGB colonel, uh, worked for the first chief directorate in Vienna. He was a German expert. Um, and his wife, Marina, was a historian. And they told me, it was around, I think it was 2010, thereabouts, that Marina said, we've been poisoned. And they didn't know what it was, but they had itching. They had all kinds of symptoms. And she was rather hysterical. She was almost like out of her mind. And I actually got her connected with the doctor that treated Yushchenko. Uh, and, and on a group phone call, they were in Moscow. And of course, I was in the US. And so was this doctor. And of course, the, the problem was, she was, we, we noticed their psychiatric symptoms, right? She's kind yeah. of crazy. Well, it turned out they managed to get to Germany and get tested. And guess what they found? massive amounts of mercury in their mm. bodies. And that's why she was crazy. If you get Such a, uh, a lot of merc mercury, <laughs> yeah, mercury will make you crazy, right? Matt is a hatter because hatters use mercury yeah. in their trade and they absorbed it through their skin and they became, you know, mad as a hatter. That's where the expression comes from. It's overexposure to mercury, which is a dangerous uh, heavy metal that can get into your brain. So poor Marina, now they both were poisoned and they believed they were poisoned in their home through the air duct system, through the heating system of their home. That's what I think they suspected. And um, to see them in the documentary, it was interesting to see them. Now what happened, now here's the thing, they're, they've escaped with what little money, they're freelance writers, they're trying to live on that. They're living in Germany. She gets cancer then ultimately. And the doctor mm -hmm. said they believed this mercury was laced with there was a radioactive element originally that then 
had yeah. then been pushed out of their bodies, but they were, had a radiation exposure. Well, she gets cancer, this runaway cancer, and she can't, they can't afford medical treatment in the West. They have to go back to Moscow, from which neither returned. And I think it was 2013 she, she died um, in a Moscow hospital. And, of course, Victor's complaint was there's no public bathrooms. You know, in the basement, maybe there's one. Yeah. There's this huge line, you know. But, I mean, again, uh, even in Moscow where life is better and, and the quality of everything is more like the West, it's still awful. But this is an example. And they just – there was no treatment for her. She knew she was – I spoke to her the week before she died. She, she was in a horrible state because she knew there was – you know, there wasn't going to be any treatment. And she yeah. knew the government had poisoned her, basically. Yeah, and people need to expect to uh, pay bribes for everything under Russian control. So uh, you want your kid to go to a you know not so horrible school? Well, you got to pay a you know, bribe. Um, you uh, travel for more than 50 miles? Well, you will be stopped along the way and cops expect a bribe. You want to get a permission for a building? pay a bribe um you want to get medical treatment or for somebody in your family pay a bribe you know the doctor will will not come to see you unless you know you have some uh, nice shiny bills uh of, of currency uh in in uh, you know w on you it's just it's just that kind of a that kind of a deal yeah and it's it's ironic because uh, this is what the irony is that in a communist system is more ruthlessly about money and about yeah. trading favors <laughs> because nobody bribery. has anything so bribes take a bigger you know have a bigger meaning it's yeah just... yeah and and so it's like i remember it very humorously um colonel stanislav lunev the gru defector said to me once he said he said america is really the marxist paradise you know everybody lives so good and the and the yeah. poor are taken care of the sick are taken care of but he said in russia it's dog eat dog capitalism right in the soviet union yeah, and of really course, dog, of course, which everybody, is an irony. Yeah, of course, in, in a Russian system, everybody is competing with everybody. So if if you want that job, if you want to rise up the ranks, um, you're gonna have competitors, and these competitors might use dirty tricks against you. So it's like this situation where um, um, where you're running into trouble just by competing in a job on on a professional, you know, in any sort of profession. Um, you make enemies, you have enemies, or you rise up the ranks and you just, um, you insult somebody higher up because you're pointing at waste, you're pointing at, you know, things being too slow, uh, then you, you've made an enemy in that system. And there's no lawyers to save you, there's no press to save you, there's no activism to save you, nothing. Um, and also when, um, um, yeah, and, and also when, uh, when you look at the Soviet era, it didn't matter how high you were in the system, you could disappear overnight. I mean, this is what would happen for such a long time. I mean, especially in the in the Stalin era. Um, and you mentioned all these details about, you know, Stalin wanted to have uh, another purge at the very top, but they took him out first. I mean, even, you know, guys like Beria, I mean, everybody felt threatened all of the time. So you always have to watch your back. Every day, everywhere, it's Moscow rules. Oh yeah, there you got. This the is uh, this is the book. This is uh, Edward uh, Radzinski's a uh, book, Stalin, and it's the first in-depth biography based on explosive new documents from Russia's secret archives. But it's also uh, interviews with the Russia's last uh, Stalin's last surviving bodyguards, and this is where we get the first confirmation what other historians. I think it was Michael Korda in his uh, biography of Stalin really had a good uh, analysis of Stalin's death, saying something else was going on there. And uh, and he actually is able to show it. Stalin was plotting World War III. He was planning to purge his colleagues who did not want to um, participate in that. And they it was Khrushchev uh, that took his bodyguards off of him yeah. on the night he had his stroke. So did he really die of a stroke yeah. if his bodyguards were removed that night? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, uh, right. I mean, there's there's a distinct possibility that Stalin was slowly poisoned over time. There's a strong possibility that Lenin was poisoned over time. If it can happen to Lenin, it can happen to you. Okay, so you're making a lot of enemies, and there's not much wealth to go around. So there's only very very few spots 
that are pleasant in a Russian style uh, system. Yeah. So and, you're fighting and for there's the. A, yeah, there's a book on North Korea on the famine in North Korea that's claimed more than a million, and this is a communist country uh, dead in North Korea, talking about, you know, there's no birds in North Korea because the people ate them all. Ate them. Right? And yeah. because they're starving, they're going to eat birds and rats and anything that moves and bugs. Um, and one of the sad things when you at the beginning of the book, the lady that put it together said that the great tragedy is that the kindest, best people died first in a famine in yeah. a communist country because they give their food to the children. Yeah, they give it's their like food a, to other people. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a communist version of eugenics, right? You kill those people that are most threatening to the psychopathic system, right? I mean, it's, it's a form of eugenics. You, I mean, you kill me, the people with the greatest empathy, the people yeah, with exactly. the greatest kindness. You kill exactly. first, yeah. And after two, three generations, I mean, there's this, you were left with the same type of people that, um, that have grown up with this mindset. And, and also, you know, on a, on a genetic level, I mean, you have genetic variability in humans because if you were all the same, you know, we couldn't really function that well. Um, but um, if you get rid of certain traits um, over time, uh, that's, that creates a, a not so pleasant, um, not so pleasant world. Um, next in my list here, I have a category, um, and and that's about relocating people. Uh, this is something I, I guess the the Putin fans in the West are absolutely not aware of that one okay but but this has been documented so many times over and over again um now um when it comes to when it comes to the the current russian propaganda um about migration in europe right um the russians have tried to milk this topic over and over again especially in 2015 and 2016 when there was this big migrant crisis and our former communist german chancellor angela merkel she just waved her magic wand and said, um, anybody who says I need asylum can cross the border into Germany, even though these people had landed in Italy and then moved from Italy to Austria and then to Germany, right? So, um, I mean, the laws basically said that Germany is not responsible for um, migrants and refugees that land in Italy. I mean, why would we be responsible? You know, because we're far further up in the north, right? But she waved her, waved her magic wand. All these people came here. It was roughly a million people in one year, which is about four to five times as many people that usually come per year. Uh, and so people need to imagine this because m maybe Americans n r didn't really see that on their news, what happened over here. So trains and train loads and train loads full of people from Libya, from Syria, Afghanistan, you know, the, uh, Afghanis came in large numbers. And so um, um, oftentimes these people came from countries that were once trained by the KGB and the Stasi, by the way. Uh, that's a whole nother ball, whole nother chapter. Um, but so all these yeah. people, all these people came here. And then um, the Russian propaganda said, uh, this is, this is an example of the great world conspiracy because it's the American the Americans that uh, told the German government to do this, to, to let this happen. Even though Angela Merkel was pro-Russian, Angela Merkel grew up in communism, and the Social Democratic Party and, that she was aligned and with... even though it was the Russian Air Force carpet-bombing Syrian towns, yeah. driving the refugees out of the country by destroying right. their homes... Um, so, so, so Angela Merkel had a, was in a coalition with the Social Democrats, and they're the biggest Russian fans ever. Uh, and so, uh, but but the propaganda said no, this is all American influence. The Americans did this did this to Germany, and um, and so then, in um, you know the 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 European Union, which is also very very left wing, and you know European Union is is full of Russian agents basically. The European Union is using a kind of old Roman style approach to relocating and migration. Whereas if people remember in the Roman Empire, they didn't really care so much what you looked like or what religion you followed as long as you accepted the overlords, the, the rulers, right? And so no group was so large that it could overpower all these other groups. So this made um, the Roman system... Uh, easier to maintain if you had like all these different people running around 
uh, that didn't get along too well with each other. And so the European Union is sort of using the same kind of style. But then comes the Russian propaganda aimed at the right wing here. And they promise a different system. They promise if Germany and Austria and all these other countries, if, if all these Western European countries, if they become protectorates of Russia, so they accept Russian leadership, um, the promise is that then within Germany, within Austria, for example, um, there would be a partial autonomy. And so um, these countries then could be as conservative as possible. Just white people, no Muslims, no migrants, everything would be, you know, super duper, uh, mega hyper conservative, right? That's the promise. But if Russia ever takes over Western Europe, we will probably see an old school Roman style system because it's cheaper and easier to maintain. The Russians oh, would absolutely. mix and match, mix and match populations and bring in Chinese and people from Kyrgyzstan and Slavs and then remove people from Europe and move them to Russia. They would do all kinds of tricks because then oh, yes. you have all these different groups here in Europe and no group is large enough to, to uh, overpower the other groups. And so the Russians can maintain their control much more easily and, and much more uh, much more cheaply, you know, uh, for that matter. Yeah. Well, it's, so it's, it's difficult to you, for a country to unite to be against Russia if it's ethnically divided within itself. Yeah. That's very difficult. Yeah, I mean, in uh, uh, recently somebody posted an animation on X. So this was a German map um, divided into West Germany and East Germany, right? And so they were flickering through all these different graphical representations of statistics, current statistics. So they were showing um, U.S. military facilities. They're all basically in the West. They were showing major corporations. They're all in West Germany. They were showing Muslim migrants. They're all in the West. Um, and so there's always this large difference between the East and the West. And so um, you have very, very many... Russian speakers in East Germany today. Um, so th these were people that, you know, had ancestors that at some point moved to Tsarist Russia, were treated like crap, um, then were treated more like crap under communism. And then when the wall came down, these people were allowed to come back. So some of them, they look like Germans, some of them, they look like Russians or, you know, in between. So um, you get the, the Russian speakers, then you get all the Muslims here, then you get the communists here, and then you get the ultra-right-wingers here. So there's all these different groups that, that Russia can use, and they can also move populations around, bring in new people and move people out of Europe uh, and move them to Russia. And this Just is what... out of curiosity, what is the percentage of the population of Germany that's Muslim right now? Um, I have to remember. I think it's about ten percent now. Uh, it's twenty. Is it that much? It's twenty. I think it's it's over twenty percent people with a migrant background, but it's diverse migrant background. It's all kinds of people, and I think the Muslim quote is like ten percent now, maybe twelve, something like that. It's and you and twenty percent not of as your high as in Russia though. Over, but, yeah, twenty percent of your country is over sixty. Yeah. Uh, that means that most of your young people are migrants? Um, most of the people under 25 are migrants? Sort of, kind of, yeah. I mean, um, are the children of migrants? Well, the um, I looked at the newest books on demographics, um, books like Empty Planet, for example, and, and they talk about how even Muslim populations are declining, especially in Europe, um, but also the entire uh, Muslim belt from North Africa to Asia. So some Muslims, they actually expected to have, you know, 20 children or 10 children each, and they will take us over and whatnot. Um, but somebody hit the brakes, you know, and put the brakes on. And, you know, it's, it's not like, it's not like it's going to turn into an entire Muslim country. Somebody is watching these Mo numbers. Modern, mo modern Muslims are dropping away from the faith or discovering the Western way of life and are, uh, basically not having as many children then yeah because you know having children is an economic risk and it's it's stressful and mm -hmm. all this bureaucracy involved and it's always about i mean these these researchers like in the book empty planet they um they basically nailed down all these different factors to make a population smaller or even make a population uh collapse and the number one or well i think the number one factor is educating women if if you influence yes. if you influence the women, you know you basically won. 
won that game. Um, but there's also economic pressures, and there's also um, there's also um, a decline of religion. So Christians used to have more children. Conservative people would have more children. Um, and um, sometimes in different places, even ba bad economy will not stop people from having children. But if you have a bad economy and you educate the women, that changes everything. Um, so it's like it's like people are watching these numbers. And I think that within the European Union, they have a certain goals. They have certain goals set. And once they hit those numbers, they hit on the brakes massively because they do not want a massive Muslim group here that can have too much influence. They want the Muslims b group big enough to, um, uh, you know, to have a certain effect, but not too big. Okay. And so with the Soviets, with the Soviets, um, you saw... Uh, moving entire segments of the population around you know just deporting the crimean tatars or whatever they were called um just moving russians to the east of russia where nobody lives or confining people who have contacts to the west confining them to siberia or some other barren land where there's nothing and so this is something that was very important in in the soviet union and um back in those days there were almost zero uh, Muslim migrants in Soviet Eastern Germany. So they had a few you know, workers there, but they had no rights. They couldn't really pray during work hours. They were treated um, badly, and so that was a strategic decision. Um, but if, if somebody in the Politburo had decided otherwise, we would have seen a great influx of um, Muslims into East Germany because... The Stasi, the, the communist Stasi trained all of these Africans and, and all of these, these Muslim countries to build up their regimes and to, to create the secret police and to train the militaries. Now, some of these African warlords and some of these um, Muslim dictators, they actually flew their people to, to East Berlin for these, uh, these training sessions. All right. So um, moving populations around was very important to the Russians and also restricting people's movements. You couldn't just move somewhere else. You couldn't, as an East German citizen, you couldn't just visit Poland. You needed, um, uh, you know, you, you needed a, um, a, a, a document from the government allowing you to visit neighboring Poland and you had to provide a specific reason for it. Okay. Now, there's an anecdote. Um, former Chancellor Angela Merkel was caught. I kid you not. This is in one of the best books about her life. She was once caught faking an invitation from Poland. She went to Poland, then returned back on train, and she was uh, checked at the border, and they found uh, leaflets in her luggage from the um, Polish Solidarity Movement. Now, nothing happened to her because her daddy was, you know, really connected to the Stasi and the KGB, and it nobody can make sense of it, or uh, pr you know, maybe pretends nobody can make sense of it. Why she was doing this trip? Maybe this was a training mission. Maybe she was, you know, training how to do this kind of stuff. We don't know, but this is just one of these anecdotes. You couldn't just visit Poland. You needed an official reason to do so. And, um, and there were internal passports. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You couldn't yeah. even travel within a communist country without showing your internal passports, your papers. And it's true in Nazi Germany during the war. You know, show, us, show me your papers. Um, yeah. You had to account for yourself. Of course... You know, again, a police state, of course. Yeah. Now, Americans, Americans can expect this type of stuff, uh, this type of activity under Russian control. So imagine if uh, some Americans, you know, engineers are being moved from America to Russia uh, and they have no choice. Right. Uh, and then the, the Russians, they bring in their people to America and they, of course, are running things. You know, if you're a Slavic Russian um, in America, you are at the, 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 the upper end, you know, the upper tier of society, okay? If you're a white devil, meaning just a white Westerner, um, you rank significantly lower, okay? Um, because they think, you know, the whites are the devils. They think so ever since Alexander Nevsky fought the, you know, the Teutonic Knights. 
Um, and so they would bring in Chinese people to America. They would bring in people from Muslim nations, um, which the Russians control. So you would see all these kinds of new people. And over time, this American population under Russian control, this, this population would become very, very much different. They could also invite Mexicans loyal to Russia uh, and just mix and match. So the white people would become a minority or they would become just one group of many. So maybe well, you white up... are a minority in California yeah. as of more yeah. than 10 years ago. Um, but I should say as in 19, this is Colonel Stanislav Lunev, uh, the GRU defector who spoke Mandarin and worked in Russia. He said that in 91 and 90, early 92, they negotiated um, like a military alliance between Russia and China and an intelligence alliance to share all intelligence, to combine all operations in the United States and to, to have them jointly done. And he said that um, the ultimate plan was to take over North America with Russia getting Alaska, parts of Canada, China getting low, lower 48 states and other countries invited in for looting rights. And then you got the speech that happened uh, uh, in, in uh, about 20 years ago, uh, 21 years ago now, of Chi Hao Chen. He was the, the Chinese defense minister. And he said, he affirmed that this was, that there was this kind of agreement. We traded land in the north for Russia so we could secure the land we wanted, which is the lower 48 states, to build a new China. And he said, we have to exterminate the existing American population. He even talks about exterminating Chinese Americans because they're Americanized, that they might not be able to make yeah. them into, into communist Chinese. And so he talks about this <clears throat> extermination. He talks about using a biological weapon to get rid of 100 to 200 million. That's just getting started to eliminate the whole 330 million. Uh, but he talks about this genocidal war and this genocidal intention. And he even says, well, this is tragic. Americans have always helped China, but it's them or us. You know, we need the land. They have it. Uh, we can't take anybody else's land without fighting America, so it might as well be American land. And um, so this is the, the the latest is that China gets the lower 48 and they get to eliminate the people here, which is terrifying, right? Yeah. And then when they would falsify it. and then they would falsify history and just make people forget the Americans ever existed. For the most part, they really do um, want to eliminate that because here's a successful capitalist country that have completely different principles than their principles. And to make people forget that this was this great country, America, existed, that these principles actually worked for having a people in a country, they don't want anyone to know that. Yeah. Um, that leads me to my next um, aspect here, which is changing the culture gradually. Okay. So, um, some people, uh, some communists believed, um, some communists believed after World War II that uh, now was the time in East Germany, uh, now was the time to completely eradicate German culture, just chain, just just completely annihilate it, and this also force people to learn Russian. Everybody needs to have uh, different names, or you just change German names, sort of morph them into Russian names and uh, just eliminate German history altogether. But um, the decision from above was different. They decided to incorporate uh, some national nationalistic elements and, and just change the culture over time. Okay, so um, for example, the communists in Germany, they, um, they, glorified, um, they glorified Bismarck for example, because Bismarck, for strategic reasons, wanted to play nice with the Russians just to keep them away um, and, and just to see if he could have a deal with the Russians again. Um, but so the communists would just fabricate this into a parallel or different version of history where, um, you know, it, it's supposed to be German to be pro-Russia, right, or pro-Soviet. And uh, and uh, they claimed that East Germany was the true Germany. It was the only legit Germany. And one day we're going to take all of Germany. Um, and so they kept these old style military uniforms. And they kept some of the marches. And they, they, they kept the language. And uh, when communism was 
over on paper, some of these communists complained we should have eradicated German culture altogether. And maybe if we had done that, we would still have communism uh, in East Germany. But um, there was the strategy of just changing culture gradually and merging things. And so you can expect that sort of stuff in other territories as well in the future. Now, it has been tried before to obliterate an entire culture. Now, the Japanese once tried it with the Koreans, for example. It is destroying uh, cultural sites, forcing people to have new names and all of that. But um, it's it's just cumbersome. It's easier it's easier to merge American culture with the elements of the Russian system. Um, so, so in this hypothetical future, the Russian the Russian controlled America would claim to be the one true America, and uh, George Washington would be compared to Vladimir Putin. You know how familiar they supposedly are. And any historic example of American-Russian cooperation would be emphasized, even going back to the Tsarist era. This is what the Russians always do. They would they go through the history books, and they find these instances of you know cooperation, whatever, and then they just amplify that and make it look like this was always meant to be. You know, this is the only true way, um, and uh, uh, they could introduce new school books very quickly and they would tell these young kids a heavily distorted um a heavily distorted version um of history so you can expect all this guilt about american expansion you know the native americans and and slavery and all that so they would maybe amplify that um amplify that gradually or they find some other um way to spin it you know for for the russian um the russian purposes and of course the degree of indoctrination will constantly be checked by the government so they do these overt and covert loyalty tests to see if that stuff that they teach will actually stick okay so um if you joke about this to your friends you know in school and say yeah well you know i don't really believe that stuff uh, some of your fr- one, at least one of your friends will report you uh, to the authorities or to the teachers because if if you snitch on somebody, the system will like you. Um, and so uh, if if you doubt the system, if you doubt the indoctrination and the distorted version of history, you will be found and your career will be restricted. So they don't they don't always arrest you. They can just ruin your career. Now there was this incident with. Um, former German Chancellor Angela Merkel when she was a a young student at school she had really good grades and it was practically a given that she would go to this prestigious university and you know work on physics advanced physics Um, but her class her graduating class they were given a last assignment they had to do this sort of improvised stage play so they they were given the task of coming up with some sort of pro-communist stage play and they made a bit of a joke out of it you know they weren't calling for revolution they weren't calling for a nicer form of socialism it was just a bit tongue-in-cheek and this caused such a scandal that it would they almost all lost access to university i mean this could have prevented Angela Merkel from visiting university but because of her powerful father who was connected uh, and uh, was supposed to um, bring the church under control she was protected and so she could go on to university but I think some some kids were not so lucky and uh, so they had to find some other job provided by the government and they could not rise up in the system Um, and also on 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 a religious note here um the orthodox russian church would probably become a major thing in russia they wouldn't outright force it onto anybody but you would quickly notice that in order to progress in the new america or part of america in order to rise up the ranks you need a membership in the orthodox church and you need to visit the church on sundays and and, you know you need to partake in all that stuff and so this is when people will start to convert for career reasons or some other reasons um and uh, other churches in america would also be under control especially the catholics 
could be linked to the Orthodox Church because they both have a direct line back to the Roman Empire. Now, the Catholic Church is Western Roman Empire, and the Orthodox Church comes from the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, so this is something... Uh, this is something you need to expect. And um, and also, in schools, turning American children um, against their parents, because the parents still remember, the parents still remember, the and the grandparents, they still remember the old America, the real America. So, uh, yeah, you would turn these children um, against their parents. And, and the children are expected to snitch on their parents. Now, this was a common occurrence in communism, especially in Eastern Germany. Um, there was this thing when, even in kindergarten, the person in charge would ask the children, hey, you know, tell me about the, you know, this evening show for children. We call it the Sandman, okay? This is sort of this, this animated, very old show. It's some sort of a silly little story and at the end of the story, the, the little Sandman throws sand in front, you know, towards the uh, the camera lens, meaning throwing sand into the eyes of the children so they would get tired and go to sleep. So they would ask these children, tell me about, you know, the, the Sandman you saw on television. Now, this was a trick question because there were two Sandmen, the capitalist Sandman from Western television, and there was the communist Sandman from the Eastern television. Now, if the kid talked about, the child talked about the Western Sandman, then of course it was clear that the family was watching Western television, which was of course illegal. And so, um, yeah, this is something you would always, uh, you always have to expect when you come under um, under Russian control, that um, they would change the minds of, of everybody, and uh, especially the young kids. And of course, you have to be part of the new children organizations, right? Because, uh, you know, then there may not be um, a direct, direct, um, uh, you know, pressure for kids to join these new youth organizations. But if you don't join, you don't get to see these other children and you can't have a career, right? So people just comply. They just become members of these organizations. And uh, it's about, yeah, it's about glorifying Russia, basically. And it's about glorifying this new system that you live under. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's uh, we're just about out of time. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. I'm Jeff Nyquist. I'm in the United States. Uh, with me has been Alex Benish in Germany. And we've been discussing um, how communism and life under Russia really works. And of course, we touched on uh, the State of the Union address by President uh, Biden, very, um, very demagogic in the, the new Marxist way in the West. And uh, Anyway, I hope everybody has enjoyed this, and uh, we will see you next week at the same time.